When we think about great feats of agricultural engineering, we might think about floating gardens like the Nahua Chinampa or terrace farms like the Philippine Cordilleras. Very few of us, including myself, would think about fungus chambers built by ants. So today let's explore a world of non-human animals that, as well as us, farm their own food. Now you may have seen an image like this in the past, with a line of ants carrying leaves across a branch. These are leafcutter ants, and they use their mandibles to cut leaves. Self-explanatory. What you might not be aware of is that these ants don't eat the leaves. They aren't collecting food for themselves. These ants are collecting leaves as fertilizer in what is one of the most interesting forms of animal agriculture on the planet. And by animal agriculture, I mean agriculture carried out by animals. Now I did a little investigating. I reached out to a bunch of universities and people who know more than me to see if there was a term that specified agriculture conducted by non-human animals. Only one person got back to me, and they advised that it's likely a form of mutualism, that they don't know of any specific terms relating to what we're talking about today. So, like the quasi-ecologist that I am, I decided to invent one. Zootrophic mutualism is the new term I've invented for non-human animals growing their own food. This is the definition I've created for zootrophic mutualism. A form of symbiotic relationship wherein one organism promotes or otherwise benefits the population of a second organism with the end goal of consuming either the second organism or a byproduct the second organism produces. It comes from the Greek word for animal, the Greek word for food, and refers to the mutual benefits for the population of each species. Mutual benefits, you might be wondering? But the ants eat the fungus. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, in order to show you how this would still benefit the species, I'm going to tell you a story about the avocado. Avocados are a fruit. The purpose for a tree of producing a fruit is to spread seeds by attracting animals that will eat the seeds and then spread them as far as they can. The avocado is native to South and Central America. It's a fleshy fruit that is delicious on toast and causes people to lose all hope of property ownership. It also has a giant seed inside called a stone. The stone is not only huge, but many parts of the avocado tree, including fruit, are toxic to small animals, making it impossible for them to spread the seed. So what could possibly be the animal that spreads the avocado seed around South and Central America? The largest native herbivore in the areas where the avocado grows is the tapir, which certainly isn't large enough to eat the avocado stone, so no animals alive can spread the seed. But some animals that were alive could. From between 50,000 and 10,000 years ago, at the end of the Pleistocene epoch, the world changed. Around the world, a global extinction of what we call megafauna occurred on every continent except Africa. Megafauna is a collective term for many prehistoric giant land mammals of various sizes and shapes. Quite a few of them you probably will have heard of. Most of these went extinct around the same time, coinciding with both the end of the last major glacial period, known colloquially as the Ice Age, and also the rise of humans, though the impact of humans in these extinctions is still a topic of debate. In South America, where the avocado is native, 80% of megafauna species went extinct in these Pleistocene extinctions, many of whom were actually the target audience for these avocado trees. These large stones would have been swallowed whole by these enormous species and then spread around South and Central America with ease. But then, the megafauna went extinct, and the avocado was left with no animals to spread its seed, slowly shrinking the territory it existed in and forcing avocado trees to compete with one another for space, nutrients, and sunlight, as the seeds couldn't be spread. That is until the Nahua. The Aztecs, or the Nahua as they called themselves, gave the avocados their name, which translates to testicle. 
This civilization, as well as several others across Central America, many of whom actually predate the Nahua, began harvesting avocados. They built orchards and suddenly the avocado, a species that was going extinct, was abundant. Today, it's globally harvested and is one of the more successful species on Earth, all because an animal, humans, decided to start a farm and eat them. Thus, a mutually beneficial relationship was born. This particular example is of course slightly different from what the leafcutter ants do. The leafcutter ants eat the entire fungus, uh, whereas we're just eating the fruit that evolved on a tree uh, to be eaten. But the allegory still stands. The species as a whole will benefit from an animal choosing to farm it, even if the individual does not. Right, so now that we've all collectively decided to use this term in our everyday lives, right guys? Guys? Zootrophic mutualism is conducted by a few different species around the globe, and basically all of them are arthropods. So we know about the leaf cutter ants and their giant underground burrows that they build. We know that they have chambers for growing fungus, which is very impressive as a non-specific group of 47 different ant species that do this. So let's take a closer look at the social structure of these farms. The older worker ants are in charge of waste disposal. They keep invasive fungus out of the farm, they move infective fertilizer to an external waste heap. The ants themselves carry the bacteria Actinomycetota in their metapleural glands. This produces a secretion that protects them from fungal infection. This bacteria also produces most of our modern antibiotics. The more you know. While the older worker ants work on that waste disposal, the next in age will likely be either the aggressive soldiers, known as mages, the foragers, known as mediae, or guards, known as miners, that guard the forager columns. And the youngest members of the colony, known as minum, will either care for the fungus chambers, or, and this isn't a joke, they will ride on the backs of the older worker ants that are disposing of waste in order to defend them from air attacks conducted by parasitic flies. So, do these farms work? Well, these colonies can have a primary mound with several other mounds reaching up to 80 meters across, filled with around 8 million ants. The minimum population required to call a settlement a city in many areas around the world is 50,000. So these leafcutter colonies are bona fide metropolises around the same population of New York City. Another species of fungus farmer lives here, in the coastal marshes of North America. Named the Marsh Periwinkle, this is a form of snail that slides up and down cord grass, chewing small holes in the reeds, which fungus will then grow out of, mimicking the kinds of behaviour we humans employ to plant new crops. They will sometimes even defecate in the holes to promote growth with their own manure. In a case of a less conventional crop harvester, and a recent discovery in the realm of crabs, a species of yeti crab named Kiwa Puravida may, and I need to repeat this, may grow bacteria on its own claws and eat that bacteria. This theory has arisen from seeing crabs wave their claws over thermal vents that it lives around, which would promote the growth of epibiotic bacteria on its claws. As far as anyone can tell, this particular crab doesn't eat any of the other organisms that live nearby, so combining this knowledge with their strange behaviour of purposefully promoting growth on their own carapace, it's very understandable why some marine biologists are coming to this conclusion that they are farming on themselves. Another underwater creature, the damselfish, have an interesting sort of zootrophic mutualism. Instead of promoting the growth of their intended meals, they choose instead to destroy everything else. The species of damselfish called the dusky farmer fish has been observed claiming territory, finding their favourite form of algae, and then weeding out any others. They aggressively fend off any other herbivorous fish, including other damselfish, and they will drive away sea urchins that come to feed as well. The fish does, however, let smaller organisms take refuge in the algae, as it seems to gain from eating not just the algae, but the smaller animals and microbes that live inside the algae. 
Sticking with ants though, there are several collectively referred to as the herder ants, so named because they keep roaming herds of aphids. Aphids eat plant matter and they excrete honeydew. Ants eat honeydew. It's sort of the equivalent of dairy farming in the insect world. The ants will corral them together to feed on plants, and the ants will die trying to defend these herds from predators such as ladybirds, wasps, or hoverfly larvae. The only problem here is that when aphids are bunched too closely together, they will naturally develop winged forms and they will fly away. So in order to prevent them from flying away, some ants will actually bite off the aphids' wings, while others produce this chemical from their mandibles that prevents the development of those wings in the first place. At least one species of herder ant, the black garden ant, will go even further to prevent the aphids from wandering off. They produce this kind of tranquilizer from their feet leaving trails of chemicals that makes these aphids drowsier than normal. A study conducted by two London universities put aphids on a piece of flypaper and exposed only some of them to this chemical. They found that aphids that were exposed to the ant tranquilizer moved about 30% slower than others. While some of the relationships that we've talked about today have been mutually beneficial and while the aphids do get protection, the ants seem to be getting a lot more out of it than the aphids, and also drugging the aphids, so they're very much skewing the relationship to their own benefit in this case. On these farms, it ain't much, but it's dishonest work. There are plenty of other examples out there that make us question what agriculture is, and if animals are actually performing it. The giant anteater will avoid over-harvesting from each ant nest that it goes around to create a sustainable population of ants that it can continue eating in the future. But they don't promote the growth of the ant nests, so they can't be counted as farmers or a part of a symbiotic relationship. Pocket gophers will eat roots as a part of their diet, but they have a hard time eating the thick underground roots that tend to grow through their tunnels. However, if you crop a root short, it sprouts into a network of smaller roots that are a lot easier for these guys to munch on. The pocket gophers will, much like the marsh periwinkles, defecate and pee all over the roots in order to get them to grow faster, promoting the growth of the kinds of organisms they wish to eat. But this doesn't really benefit the plant they're eating. Zootrophic mutualism, while not perfect, is a defined term that I'm hoping we can use to discuss these behaviours. Instead of using terms focusing on agriculture and applying anthropomorphism to these species. It can be difficult to tell what does and doesn't count as agriculture in the animal kingdom because when it comes to animals that farm, some animals are more equal than others. On the whole, zootrophic mutualism as a behavior is seemingly beneficial to the overall persistence of the species involved. Now humans just have to figure out how to get our agriculture to be less destructive and maybe we'll be able to ensure the overall persistence of not just our own species, but the species that call this planet home. I'm Ben, the Quasi-Ecologist, and thank you all so much for joining me in this episode of Natural World Explored. Until next time, stay curious, friends. The largest native herbivore in this region is the tapir. Let me... Taper. Taper.